Baik, uh, selamat pagi Bapak dan Ibu semua. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Uh, yang terhormat Bapak Kepala Pusat Pengembangan Sumber Daya Manusia Aparatur serta seluruh pegawai di lingkungan Kementerian SDM. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Selamat bergabung dalam webinar pagi ini yang berjudul Using IELTS to Advance Your Future Study. Hari ini kita kedatangan narasumber keren ya, yaitu Mr. Douglas sebagai IELTS Facilitator, dan juga Miss Harry, Education Counselor IALF, Lembaga Pelatihan Bahasa Inggris Internasional. Materi yang akan dipaparkan oleh Mr. Douglas dan Miss Harry akan meliputi pembahasan lebih mendalam mengenai IELTS, tips untuk studi di luar negeri dengan perwakilan dari University of Western Australia, dan di akhir sesi, uh, Mr. Douglas akan ada tryout singkat untuk memberikan gambaran seperti apa tes IELTS nantinya. Semoga kegiatan hari ini bisa bermanfaat bagi kita semua ya. Oke. Okay. Baik, waktu sudah menunjukkan pukul 9, untuk itu mari kita mulai kegiatan hari ini. Pertama-tama kita awali dengan sambutan dari Bapak Kepala Pusat Pengembangan Sumber Daya Manusia Aparatur, Pak Bambang Utoro. Untuk Pak Bambang, kami persilahkan. Baik, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Selamat pagi, salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I, I'm honored to join everyone on this occasion. I would like to greet all of the participants and the, particularly from the ILF, Ms. Denise Finney, CEO ILF of Indonesia. Thank you very much for your support, ILF Indonesia. Mr. Douglas uh, and Ms. Harry Her Her as our speaker for today's webinar. Thank you for join joining and supporting our event. I hope we can raise awareness of the importance of IELTS in today's lives especially in career and academic affairs. Ms. Dennis, Ms. Douglas, and Ms. Harry, uh, let me speak bahasa for my, for the audience. Uh, Oke, okay, terima kasih. Jadi, uh, Bapak, Ibu, teman-teman, peserta webinar pagi ini yang saya banggakan, saya hormati. Puji syukur kita banyak dengar Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Tuhan Esa karena kita bisa berkumpul di pada kegiatan ini. Jadi kegiatan ini penting bagi Bapak Ibu semua peserta karena nanti akan dijelaskan IELTS memang artikulari untuk akademik tapi bisa juga untuk karir Bapak Ibu tentunya ya. Nah jadi uh, Bapak Ibu uh, dapat saya sampaikan mengapa ada webinar ini. Jadi selain webinar BPSDM Pusat BPSDM Paratur juga menyelenggarakan pelatihan, pelatihan bahasa Inggris, uh, dan juga arts preparation untuk Bapak Ibu, peserta Bapak teman-teman semua yang ada ingin belajar uh, sekolah untuk ambil tingkat yang lebih tinggi, baik S2, S3, baik dalam luar negeri. Di sini saya sampaikan kenapa ini menjadi penting ya, pimpinan, khususnya di BPSDM, itu punya program yang luar biasa. Kalau Bapak Ibu mungkin sudah tahu bahwa kita punya beasiswa tugas belajar luar negeri, kita punya program magang industri. Jadi selain magang antar eselon satu itu untuk para fresh employee, nah kita juga ada magang industri. Lalu juga ada magang pada international organization, organisasi internasional. Kita sudah pendekatan tahun ini sepertinya kita akan mengirimkan peserta magang untuk OECD, IA. International Energy Forum, IEF. Nah, kita juga mendekati coba IEE maupun OPEC. Nah, yang saya sebutkan tadi, tubel dalam dan luar negeri, magang industri, magang internasional, itu harus ada, harus bersifat selektif. Salah satu syarat selektifnya adalah IELTS. Nah, IELTS yang diminta bagi Bapak-Ibu yang ingin ikut program magang ini adalah kalau kita sekolah misalnya, enam setengah untuk program S2, dan tujuh untuk Bapak Ibu yang ambil master, eh, ambil doktor, sorry. S2, enam setengah, dan S3, tujuh. Nah, memang pimpinan mengharapkan kandidatnya harus kandidat yang berkualifikasi, yang tough, gitu ya, salah satunya dalam, dalam berbahasa Inggris. Kita tahu ketika kandidat yang kita kirim dengan kirim sudah 
pandai berbahasa Inggris dengan grade yang tinggi, maka tidak ada akan ada kesulitan dalam nanti baik itu belajar, magang seperti Bapak Ibu itu. Ini uh, banyak manfaat nanti ketika Bapak Ibu itu beasiswa, Bapak Ibu magang industri maupun Bapak Ibu teman-teman semua biar magang di International Organization. Nah, ini jadi buat itu concernnya kami melihat hal ini sehingga silakan nanti Bapak Ibu diskusi dengan pakarnya uh, Mr. Douglas ini dari Wisconsin United States. Nah, jadi ini. Nah, jadi itu uh, alasan mengapa uh, kita mengadakan webinar IELTS. Nah, setelah tahu ini, silakan intip programnya PPSD Maparatur. Ya, intip apa saja sih? Nah, silakan. Dan itu luar biasa. Itu akan membangun karir Bapak Ibu ke depan. Karena Bapak Ibu bisa dapat beasiswa, dapat beasiswa magang industri, dan syarat-syaratnya uh, akan apa setelah bapak ibu mengikuti itu itu akan menjadi uh, insya allah karir bapak ibu uh, maupun kemampuan bapak ibu jadi ya karir dan kemampuan bapak ibu dalam hal uh, dalam hal menunjang tugas bapak ibu sehari hari nanti jadi hal lain yang kita juga tahu ya tentang as as itu kan berbasis berbahasa inggris ya bahasa inggris itu paling bahasa yang paling bisa diterima di hampir semua negara nah khususnya negara-negara yang tidak menggunakan bahasa Inggris sebagai ibu atau sebagai bahasa nasionalnya bahasa ibu bahasa nasional seperti Indonesia maka harus IELTS ya dan ternyata IELTS itu sudah diterapkan di 130 negara 130 negara dengan sebanyak lebih 300 mahasiswa universitas di Amerika lalu ada universitas di latih seluruh New Zealand Australia Inggris itu pakai IELTS Program tubel yang kita tawarkan itu rata-rata program tubel yang meminta IELTS Bapak Ibu teman-teman semua. Program uh, tubel luar negeri ya. Nah, jadi kita nawarkan itu. Nah, ini makanya di sini kami memfasilitasi, kami mengencourage teman-teman semua yang eligible. Silakan. Silakan kita akan support karena program kita adalah bagaimana meningkatkan SDM Kementerian SDM yang qualified bahkan orientasi internasional. Ketika kami bicara, kami ada bank international organization, maka kawan dari uh, mantan BKN pun bilang, ini bagus Pak, karena birokrasinya berwawasan internasional. Jadi kita mau coba membangun birokrasi berwawasan internasional. Birokrasi yang go abroad gitu loh Pak, Bapak Ibu. Nah, mari kita buktikan tentang kualitasi uh, pemerintah yang go abroad, khususnya pemerintah, pemerintah di Indonesia, dan khususnya adalah kementerian CM. Saya mengharapkan, mengikat semua teman-teman, yang eligible silakan dan mari nanti di sini saya berharap teman-teman bisa mengambil manfaatnya bisa di trigger bisa di encourage dengan webinar ini sekali lagi silakan intip program-programnya PPSD Maparatur saya rasa itu eh, kepada Bapak Ibu saya, saya saya harapkan semangatnya terus untuk memajukan Kementerian SDM dan tentu of course uh, thank you very much for uh, thank you very much for Mr Douglas Mr Douglas and Miss Harry and Ibu Denis Vini thank you for your cooperation thank you for your support uh, particularly from IELF Indonesia and uh, I say uh, thank dalam uh, bahasa sorry dengan memanjatkan puji syukur kepada Allah Subhanahu wa taala yang maha semoga program webinar ini memberikan kita manfaat, memberikan kita hidayah, memberikan kita pencerahan dengan petunjuk, dan menjadikan kita lebih baik lagi ke depannya, khususnya dalam rangka menjalankan tugas fungsi kita di Kementerian Energi dan Sumbangan. Terima kasih. Saya akhiri. Mohon maaf kepada tim. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Terima kasih Pak Bambang atas sambutannya yang sangat informatif, suportif, dan juga penuh harapan. Semoga webinar hari ini berjalan lancar dan bisa memberi banyak manfaat bagi kita semua. Oke, okay. saat ini hadir juga bersama kita CEO dari IALF Indonesia, Miss Denise, yang akan memberikan sambutan untuk webinar hari ini. Miss Denise, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to our seminar, exploring IELTS as a way to advance your future studies. Uh, thank you to Pat Bambang Toro and the team at BPSDM for making this possible. We are delighted to be with you all after working with the ASDM to conduct language training programs at ILF Gatting Spong in 2022. So 
Now I'm going to ask all of you to switch heads from thinking in Indonesian to thinking in English. Your challenge for the rest of the morning. Are you ready? I hope so. <laughs> we have a great team for you today. Um, Douglas, Douglas Lerquin knows more about IELTS than just about anyone else I know. Um, ILF has been conducting the IELTS test since it was first launched in 1990. And Douglas has been involved in IELTS at the ILF for a significant part of his career. He has lots of information and tips for you today. And um, today is also the start of a journey for many of you. Um, and Douglas is, represents the start of the journey, studying English and in, for academic purposes and to, for the IELTS test. Um, and we welcome Ibu Imadewi from U UWA, who will talk about what happens at the other end of the journey when you're actually studying overseas. Just remember that the great thing about preparing for the IELTS test is that you are preparing for the real life experience of academic studies in English. The IELTS test tests your English skills in the context of uh, academic studies. So during IELTS preparation, you're not wasting your time trying to understand and memorize some obscure piece of English grammar. You are using your time to develop the kind of academic English and study skills you need for academic success. So sit back and enjoy the presentation. I think you might have to do a little work as well. And once again, Slamat Hagi, Slamat Balajar, and Olga's success, Salalu. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Denise. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Denise. We are hoping that this collaboration will bring benefits for everyone in the future. Baik, setelah ini kami akan memasuki sesi paparan materi oleh Mr. Douglas. Mr. Douglas akan didampingi oleh Mr. Happy untuk presentasinya mengenai IELTS hari ini. Mr. Douglas, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Beforehand, yes. Uh, very clear. Teachers. Fantastic. Thank you. MC, I'm... Kita... Yes. Mm -hmm. MC, kita take pictures dulu ya. Okay, well, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I, as Denise mentioned earlier, I've been working at the IALF for a long time. So I've probably met some of you if you've already been to Australia doing a master's degree. So I'm very happy to see a lot of you here today. So what I'll be doing today is giving you as much information about IELTS as I can and hopefully as many tips and strategies as I can. And I will share, if I haven't yet, some files with you that we'll go through today. Um, now, I do have a PowerPoint presentation, and it has a lot of slides. Um, and I have to admit, I'm not very good at using Zoom, so please bear with me, okay? Okay, so as, as I've got on the screen here, my name is Douglas Lerquin, and as Denise said, I'm from the IALF. And today what I'd like to do is explain to you what exactly IELTS is. And we'll go through IELTS task one and two writing. I'll talk about what you have to do in the speaking test. And hopefully I can give you a short sample of a speaking test. If not, there's going to be an attached file that you can do as follow-up work on that later. And I'll explain what to do in the listening test. And we'll do a mock listening so you'll get a chance to try that. And then I'll talk about what to expect in the reading and also give you some tips. And I have one reading passage with six questions that hopefully we'll have time to do. 
And then we'll have time at the end if you have any questions. So please save any questions you have until the end or send to the moderator so they can put them all together and ask at the end. If you have any questions or, or comments, let the moderator know during the presentation. Thank you. So IELTS is the International English Language Testing System, and it's designed to test how good your English is or maybe how bad your English is. And it's the world's most popular test for two purposes, studying and working. And I'll explain a bit of that later on. This bar chart I'm using just to give you an idea of what you're gonna have in task one, writing. It shows how many tests were taken around the world um, from, here 1995 and it goes up until 19 sorry until 2017 and from 95 to 2000 not many tests were taken from 2001, there was there was some growth, but starting in 2010 until 2017, and until now, but we won't talk about that. Um, you can see in 2017, 3.1 million tests were taken. This is much higher now. IELTS is owned, operated, managed, run by Cambridge, British Council, and IDP. And these three organizations deliver the test, and they have test locations all over the world, including the IALF, which again is Indonesia's longest running IELTS test center. We've been here since the very beginning. We have never left, and we conduct the test all over Indonesia. Before we get too far, I do want to mention, you may have heard of different terms. IELTS, this is what we'll talk about today. It's accepted by well over 10,000 organizations worldwide. So we'll talk about IELTS. There's another term which is called IELTS for UKVI. This is only used in the UK for some visa and immigration purposes. Only take that test if the university tells you to. It's a lot more expensive. Most people don't need that test. It's the same test. So we are talking about IELTS for UKVI, but most of you don't need that test. There's another term. This is IELTS life skills. This is not what we're talking about today. This is only used for immigration purposes. It's a listening and speaking test, so it wouldn't be good for you because you can't use it for university entry. And again, IELTS is accepted by institutions all over the world. I remember when I was a student, it was TOEFL. Everyone accepted TOEFL. Not anymore. IELTS is, I think, widely accepted and probably the best test for you. It's very straightforward, and I'll explain about this today. So IELTS tests your listening, reading, writing, and speaking. One of the best things about IELTS is there is the speaking test. So you'll actually talk to someone like me face-to-face, -face, and they will give you a score on you're speaking. So that's one of the good things because Indonesians, you know, are, like to talk, don't they? Indonesians should be quite good in speaking. IELTS is not a test of British or Australian or American English. All are okay. It's not a test of grammar. Grammar is part of the test. Um, they look at the grammar, but there's no grammar section. Language is a lot more than just grammar. It's not a test of your ability to work or study. It's not a pass or fail test. Everyone who takes the test will get a certificate and you'll know exactly your level of English and what you need to do to improve. It's not a test that relies on computer skills or typing skills. 
you can choose to do the computer test or you can choose to do the paper-based test. It's the same test, it's just a different format. If you're good at using the computer and typing, do the computer test. If you're better at writing by hand, do the paper test. And earlier I said there is a dual purpose for work and for study. So we have the academic module and we have the general training module. The general training is used for people for work or for migration. So we won't talk about that. We'll talk about the academic module. The test, if you do the, the paper test, for example, it starts at nine in the morning, the listening, 30 minutes, 40 questions. The reading, 60 minutes, 40 questions. And then the writing, 60 minutes, there's two questions or two tasks. Then you'd have a break and then the speaking would be done and that's 11 to 14 minutes. So I'll talk about all of these in, in quite detail today. And IELTS is, has a nine band scale system. So if you take the test, you'll get between a one and a nine. Nine is the best. So it's probably a native speaker level like me. Um, if you're going to a university, you'd need a six or a 6.5 or a seven. And this will depend on the university and it'll depend on the program that you're in, attending. But we'll talk about six, 6.5 and seven, because I know that is what you're going to need to get into a university. So all my tips and strategies today are really aimed at you to get a six or a 6.5 or a seven or a 7.5 or higher. So we'll, everything I talk about will focus on helping you get at least a six. You'll get an overall band, but you'll also get a listening, reading, writing, and speaking score. The four scores are added together, divided by four, and that will be your overall score. As I said, the listening and reading are 40 questions, and they calculate the score using math. A band seven would be 30 or 31 correct. A band eight, 35 or 36. Band nine, 39 or 40, correct. But the good thing is for a six, it's only 23 or 24, correct. That's a lot of questions wrong and you can still get a band six. If you can only get 15 out of 40 though, that's only a band five. You're gonna have to keep practicing or improving your English, hopefully at the IALF. And this writing and speaking we'll talk about, I'll show you a simple version of this. In the follow-up PDF file, you'll have this. And uh, again, once you finish the test, you'll get a certificate like this, and it's good for two years. After two years, a university won't accept it. They want to know what your English level is now. So even if you have one of these from five years ago, I'm sorry, you can't use it. You'll have to do another IELTS test. So today we're going to talk about the writing first, because that's what gives Indonesians the most difficulty. Then we'll look at the speaking, then the listening, and then the reading. So writing, there's two questions, and they're called tasks, because you have to do what they task you to do they so you have to do what they ask you to do that's why we're calling it a task and we'll look at task one first task one is very straightforward they'll give you a table or a graph or a chart maybe a process or a map or an object or a combination you have to summarize those spend about 20 minutes write at least 150 words. And I'll explain what I recommend you do to get a good score. You have to have an overview and you have to have the main features. You have to compare when you can and you have to use figures or data to support what you're writing about. Again, don't spend any more than 20 minutes 
So I'm going to give you three rules that I think are the best way to do test one. Write an introduction, just saying what, where, and when. Write an overview. This is one sentence. It's like a summary, a one sentence summary. Then highlight the key features, the most important things, what anyone would notice when they look at that diagram and then support it with data if there is data. So going back to this one, if you had to write a task one, 150 words, could you do it? That's why earlier I mentioned the first few years, not many people took the test. Slight growth here and dramatic growth here. These three things are some things we can write about. So using my three rules first, just paraphrase the instructions that they give you. So write an introduction, what, where, and when. The bar chart shows the number of IELTS tests taken from 1995 to 2017. Then, and again, this is extremely important if you're trying to get a six or higher, one sentence overall. The number of tests taken grew dramatically from slightly above zero in 95, then to 3.1. And then in the later years, it had the highest number of tests. And then highlight the key features. I mentioned from 1995 to 2010, not many tests were taken. I can give some numbers for this. Then the minor growth, and again, a couple of numbers. And then where the main growth started, I'll write about that and include some of these numbers. So this is all very important because it's three key features and it's supported with data. So if you put it together, it'll look something like this on your test paper. And it's 180 words, which is enough because you need 150. Then the examiner is going to read all of this and say, is there a summary? Yes. Are the key features there? Yes. Are there numbers? Yes. And they'll give you a score based on that. You might get one pie chart. You might get one line graph. You might get one of each. You could get two pie charts or three pie charts, but the way to do it is the same. Use those three rules. For this one, I recommend the same thing, an introduction, overall, what you can see, then one paragraph about the pie chart and one paragraph about the line graph, the key features with numbers to support. This is 184 words. Uh, you could get a map or a picture or a process like this, and you do the same thing. Introduce it, so summarize whatever it says here. Write an overall, oh, this shows how bricks are made using one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps, and then how they're delivered. Then in your key features, you'll just go through the first step, the next one, the step after that, go through all of the steps. And then the examiner will read your paper. They're going to look, did you have a clear overview? Is there one sentence that summarizes everything? They're going to read it and ask, is it logical? Does it make sense? Have you used cohesive devices? The first, the second, because pronouns, it, they, them. Then they'll look at the vocabulary and the grammar. And if you're trying to get a six or higher, don't use all simple vocabulary. Try to have some less common idioms are okay. Maybe not useful in a task one, but don't use all the same 
vocabulary. So for example, Lexis is another word for vocabulary. Grammar, they're looking for some complex structure. So don't just use simple sentences. I am Douglas. My name is Douglas. I am talking to you. I am looking at you. Now, these are very good sentences, but they're all simple. If you combine some sentences and say, my name is Douglas, uh, sorry, the presenter, comma, whose name is Douglas, comma, is giving tips about doing IELTS. Now, that's a longer, complex sentence, so that'll get you a higher score. If you're going for a band six or higher, you need to do a little bit more than what would be expected at the lower band. You want to impress the examiner, just like you impress your boss, I'm sure. For task two, it's different. It's just an essay. Think back to when you were in high school or when you were in university. How many essays did you write? Probably a lot. And this is what IELTS is looking for. It's a quick and easy way for you to show them that you're able to write, including a point of view or an argument or discussing and solving a problem. So when I say essay, we're looking for at least three paragraphs, hopefully four, maybe five, maybe six. It's most important that you answer all parts of the task. Whatever they ask you to do, you have to do if you're trying to get a six or higher. Use paragraphing, good thinking. It's got to be 250 words, so you should spend 40 minutes. Task two contributes more than task one to the writing score, so spend more time on task two. Don't spend much time on task one if you're trying to get a band six or higher. You need to spend more time on task two because whatever you get in task two is probably the score you'll get for the writing. So make sure you write a good essay. And to write a good essay, first you have to understand the question. Then you can plan it and you'll have paper um, you can do it in the paper test, on the paper, the test paper. In the computer test, they'll give you a piece of paper. You can make a plan. Don't start writing until you have a plan. Then you write the essay, and then you have to read it, proofread. When you're writing, make sure you start with an introduction. Have two or three or four body paragraphs and a conclusion if you have time. The problem with task two is there are many different question types. Hopefully you'll get one like this. Do you agree or disagree? To what extent do you agree or disagree? For this, you can 100% agree, 100% disagree, 50-50, 40-60. It all depends on you as long as you answer the question. Whichever side is easier or whichever side you can come up with more examples, that's the one to focus on. You don't really have to cover both sides. They're asking you to cover one side. If you get another type like discuss A and B or does A outweigh B, you must discuss both sides, side A and side B. If you don't discuss both, you'll get a low score. You, you could also get another question that says, discuss both sides and give your own opinion. Now, this means you've got to discuss A and you've got to discuss B, and then you have to give your own opinion at the end. The examiner needs to see those three things if you're going to get a good score. There are many other types as well. They might ask for reasons and suggestions, problems, solution, advantage and disadvantage. Again, whatever the question is, make sure you do whatever you're asked. For example, if you're asked to describe some of the problems that overpopulation causes and suggest one possible solution, well, you have to have at least two problems 
caused by overpopulation, you know, maybe poverty and famine. And you have to have at one at least one possible solution. The government should give everyone money. As long as you do at least what they tell you to do in the in the test paper, you can get a good score. You can have three or four problems if you want and three or four solutions, but make sure it's what you can focus on and cover during 40 minutes. They're going to look at your essay. Is it clear? Is it, you know, that's why I have an introduction and a thesis statement and then paragraphs with topic sentences. This will make it logical, easy to follow, easy to read. They will think it's logically organized. And then the vocab and the grammar, just like task one, they'll look at that. And each of these counts as 25%. And then you'll get the writing score based on that. Before we move on, I wanna give you an example. If the question in your task two is, some people say school students should wear school uniforms. Like in Indonesia, I think everybody wears a school uniform, don't they, when they go to school? Other people think that students should be able to choose what they wear to school. For example, me, when I was in America, I never saw anyone that had a uniform when they went to school. I didn't even know there was such a thing as school uniforms. But in the paper, they might ask you to discuss both views and give your own opinion. So you'd have to talk about why students should wear school uniforms, why students should be able to choose what they wear, and then what you think. Should they wear uniforms or not? And again, make a plan. You have to have a couple of, of features, a couple of ideas to support. You know, when you say students should not wear school uniforms, maybe it infringes on their freedom and liberty. <laughs> and then after you have a plan, write, have an introduction, paraphrase the question, and then have a thesis statement. This essay will discuss both views and end with my opinion. Then have a paragraph here about why students should wear uniforms, a paragraph about why students should be free to choose what they wear, and then a final paragraph in your opinion. Is it better that students wear uniforms or they choose what they wear to work uh, to school? Then if you have extra time, you can add a concluding paragraph, which is just going to be a summary of your introduction. So that would be a four or a five paragraph essay. And hopefully it would get you a good score. Make sure you don't use any bullet points. Don't do any numbering. They want text, a normal short essay. So no title, no subtitles or anything. So once you put your what I put on the previous screen together, it would be something like this. Introduction, introductory paragraph, first body, second body paragraph, third body paragraph, and then a conclusion if you have time. Do it like this and you'll get a good score if your English is okay. Just make sure you read it, read what you've written, correct simple mistakes, you know, like desert and dessert. A desert has sand, so it's one S. Dessert is like ice cream. And if you eat ice cream, you want two scoops of ice cream. So dessert has two S's. So read what you've written and make sure any mistakes, if you've written the wrong word uh, or you spelled it wrong incorrectly, you can fix it when you proofread. Okay, let's look at the speaking test. The speaking test, so nowadays, many of you are used to doing Zoom or other video calls. And 
this is good because you'll be used to talking face to face with people. And for IELTS, the speaking test is face to face. Normally it's done in person in the test center, but one option is also video call. And you'll you'll talk for 11 to 14 minutes with the examiner. Part one, it's some simple questions about you. Part two, they'll give you a minute to talk about something and then two minutes to talk. And they won't interrupt, they'll just sit and listen to you talk for two minutes. So maybe it'll be about your favorite movie. You'll have a minute to make a plan and then you'll talk for two minutes about your favorite movie. Then part three is four to five minutes and that's more abstract, more general. It's not about you. It's about people, people in Indonesia, people in your country. So maybe they'll ask about movies. If, if part two, you had to talk about a movie, part three, they would talk about maybe movies. Uh, what kinds of movies do Indonesians like to watch? Where do they like to watch? Um, do you like to watch foreign films? Why? So again, part one will be simple questions on two or three topics about you. Maybe where you work or study or your family, sports, TV, news. It could be anything. It's just some simple topics and questions about you. So part one, it just gives you a chance to get used to the test. Part two is more important, but they'll give you a minute to make a plan on a piece of paper. So make some notes, talk about who, what, where, when, why. The, the test paper will have some bullet points. You can use those if it's helpful. Now, this one says, describe something you would like to do in the future if you had a chance. Well, for most of you, it'll be, I'd like to do a postgraduate or I'd like to do a PhD in Australia at, I don't know, Australia National University or something. So make a plan for that and talk about it. Why you want to do it? Will you do it? Why might you not do it? What would your family think? What would what would happen at work? You know, what will you see in Australia? It's endless. This is two minutes. You can just talk. Show the examiner that you can talk in English and your grammar is good and vocabulary is good. Then they go to part three. These will be more general, abstract. They're they're difficult. Some of them, some of them are easy enough. You know, what, what kinds of thing do people make plans for in their daily life? Oh, well, I think people plan what they're gonna eat. Three, you know, you gotta eat three times a day. So some people wake up in the morning and they think, oh, for lunch, I'm gonna go to McDonald's. And then at night, I think I'm going to go to that fish and chips place down the road. So maybe that's one thing. So anyway, they'll this will go on for five minutes. They'll ask maybe two or three different topics, but they're related to part two. And then they're going to give you a score. They're going to look at your fluency. Could you keep talking at length? If yes, well, that's a seven, eight, or nine. Usually is a five or a six. And if you can't keep talking at length, that's a one, two, three, or a four. Um, lexical resource and grammar. Now these are the same like in task one writing and task two writing. Can, is your grammar and your vocabulary good enough? Usually, okay, five or a six, if, if it's, Yes, then a seven, eight, or nine. And then they'll look and see what's your pronunciation like. Does it sound like you're speaking English or does it sound like you're speaking Japanese or 
Arabic or something. So you usually I would I would say Indonesians have very good English pronunciation. So as long as you can control, make it sound natural, you should be fine. Um so when you do the speaking test, be calm, be natural, smile, talk as if you're speaking to a friend. You know, the examiner is not your enemy. They just want to ask you questions and hear your English. So give full responses, give reasons if possible. Use good feature, uh, cohesive features. But because, oh, there are two reasons that happen. Recording the first, stopped. The first reason that happens is, the second reason that happens, politely ask the examiner to repeat if you don't understand a question. That's fine. Recording in progress. You know, if you don't understand, just say, oh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Usually they can repeat the question, or you could say, oh, I don't understand that word. Could you paraphrase that word? That's fine. Try to use a variety of vocabulary. Don't just use simple, simple vocabulary. Um, idioms are fine. Anything extra, anything natural in English, things that you hear native speakers use, use. Use a variety of sentence types again, not just simple sentences. In part two, make sure you make a plan so that you can talk for two minutes. Use good pronunciation, you know, use R, ah, uh, rather than R. Uh, don't break your sentences up. I am a student. Now, that's not very good. But if you say, I am a student, well, that's good. So, so use natural English. Uh, I think I have time to give a sample. This, this is actually included in um, the handouts that I've given you. So we're not actually going to watch this. I, I think I'll, I'll show you like just a minute of it, just to give you an example of what it's going to look like. The link is in the handout that you'll have. All right. Remember, you have one to two minutes for this, so don't worry if I stop you. I'll tell you when the time is up. Can you start speaking now, please? Yes. So, uh, about four months ago, I went to South uh, Southeast Asia with a friend. We we were planning to do a, a trip around South Asia, and we started uh, the trip in Laos. Uh, we, we've been told that we could buy the, the visa uh, from Laos to Vietnam on the border. So we were in Vientiane, that is the capital of Laos, and we took a bus called VIP, but actually it was not <laughs> VIP at all. And we made um, a 20 hours tr bus trip uh, to the, um, the next border where we were going to we were going to stay there because the next bus that would cross the border was I'm going to stop there. Hopefully everybody could hear that. Again, this is included in in the file that should have been shared to you or will be shared. Mariana is the woman's name, and this is an example of a band six. You'd have to watch the whole thing to see why she's not why she's a six, not higher or lower. But that's what you should expect when you do the speaking test. That was part two. Uh, and then once you go to the test center, your speaking test will be something like this with the examiner and the candidate. Let's go on. Let's talk about the listening test. The listening test is 30 minutes. There's four sections and you have 40 questions. Each question is one mark. There's no penalty for wrong answers. So 
make sure you try all of them. You get the marks for the correct ones. American or British spelling is okay. In the paper test, you'll use a pencil, you'll listen, and you'll write all the answers in the question booklet. And then at the end, you'll have 10 minutes to transfer it to the answer sheet. And they use a loudspeaker, no headphones. The computer test is the same exact test as the speaking test, but it's on the computer. So you type your answers directly into the question spaces. There's no 10 minute time to transfer at the end. And they use headphones. And remember to get a six, you would need at least 23 or 24 and a seven, at least 30 or 31. During the listening test, and I have to say, I think the listening test is very easy and it's very straightforward if your English is okay. All the questions go in order. So they'll tell you, look at questions one to six. So you look at the, the six questions and you think, well, what word form or what kind of word or number do I need to listen for? Listen for it. Write the answer when you hear it, then go to the next one and then get that one and go to the next one. If you miss one, forget it. Go to the next question. One question isn't a big deal. Listen for synonyms. On the paper, it might say daily, and then you'll hear the person in the CD say each day. Well, that's the same. Two weeks, they might say a fortnight. Twice, they might say two times. So be ready with synonyms. You'll hear the recordings only once. If you miss an answer, just go to the next one. Spelling is important. If you spell it wrong, it's wrong. Writing dates, as long as it's it, they know uh, the date is correct, it's okay. Any version uh, appropriate in English is okay. So 24th April, April 24, 424, you know, those are all okay. Clear handwriting is important. Now we're gonna do a sample. Uh, there's just 10 questions. It's one section. Um, hopefully everybody has this. If not, um, happy the moderator can send it to you. There's 10 questions. If you jot the answers down on a piece of paper, that would be great. Section two. It, so it should be this file, the National Arts Center. So if you can have that open and listen, write your answers on a piece of paper, and I'll give you the answers after we listen to this. Section two. You will hear a radio broadcast called Focus on the Arts. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16 on page four. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello, and welcome to Focus on the Arts. I'm your host, Dave Green, and this is your very own local radio programme. Every Friday evening, we put the spotlight on different arts and culture facilities and look at the shows and events that are on offer in the coming week. And today, the focus is on the National Arts Centre. Now, if you don't already know it yourself, I'm sure you've all heard of it. It's famous throughout the world as one of the major venues for classical music. But did you know that it's actually much more than just a place to hear concerts? 
The centre itself is a huge complex that caters for a great range of arts. Under a single roof it houses concert rooms, theatres, cinemas, art galleries and a wonderful public library, as well as service facilities including three restaurants and a bookshop. So, at any one time, the choice of entertainment there is simply enormous. So, how did they manage to build such a big arts complex right in the heart of the city? Well, the area was completely destroyed by bombs during the war in 1940. So the opportunity was taken to create a cultural centre that would be what they called the city's gift to the nation. Of course, it took a while for such a big project to get started, but it was planned in the 60s, built in the 70s, and eventually opened to the public in 1983. Ever since then, it has proved to be a great success. It's not privately owned, like many art centres, but is still in public hands. It's run by the City Council. Both our National Symphony Orchestra and National Theatre Company were involved in the planning of the project, and they're now based there, giving regular performances every week. And as the centre is open 363 days of the year, there are plenty of performances to choose from. Before you hear the rest of the broadcast, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20 on page 5. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So, to give you some idea of what's on, and to help you choose from the many possibilities, we've made a selection of the star attractions. If you're interested in classical music, then we recommend you go along to the National on either Monday or Tuesday evening at 7.30 for a spectacular production of The Magic Flute, probably the most popular of all Mozart's operas. It's in the Garden Hall, and tickets start at only £8, but you'll have to be early if you want to get them that cheap. And remember, it's only on for those two evenings. For those more interested in the cinema, you might like to see the new Canadian film, which is showing on Wednesday evening at 8pm in Cinema 2, and that's called Three Lives. It's had fantastic reviews, and tickets cost just £4.50, which is a reduction on the usual price of £5.50. So, it's really good value, especially for such a great movie. But you can see the centre's main attraction at the weekend, because on Saturday and Sunday, 11am to 10pm, they're showing a wonderful new exhibition that hasn't been seen anywhere else in Europe yet. It's a collection of Chinese art called Faces of China. That's in Gallery 1, and it has some really fascinating paintings and sculptures by leading artists from all over China. And the good news is that it's completely free, so don't miss it. So why not go along to the National Arts Centre next week for one or all of these great events? And you can always pick up a programme and check out all the other performances and exhibitions on offer, or coming soon, on almost every day of the year. Next week, we'll be looking at the new Museum of Science. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So hopefully before you answered, you previewed, so you knew what you were listening for, you know? You didn't just go in blindly. They gave you time. So check your answers. Make sure you have what is written here. Classical music, or one of those versions, bookshop, or bookstore, planned, and it needs to be spelled correctly, double N. 1983 or the 1980s. Managed by the city council, and then 363 days per year. 
the garden hall or garden hall, the three lives. And again, it has to be spelled correctly. So L-I-V-E-S. Four pounds, 50 faces of China. So that was 10 questions. So think about, count up how many you, you got correct. Hopefully it was 10 or nine or eight or seven. Six is still okay because if you take six, imagine there were four sections, six times four is 24. If you only had five, five times four, oh, that's only a 20 correct. So that's probably a five or a 5.5. In those, in that case, you'd have to do more practice, get listening practice, improve your English, hopefully take a course. But that's what to expect. You'll have four sections just like that. I just want to mention what the reading test is briefly before we go into questions and answers. The reading test is 60 minutes, 40 questions in three sections. And again, each question is one mark. There's no penalty for wrong answers. So try to answer them all. Um, you get the marks for the correct ones. For the paper test, there's no time at the end to transfer your answers. So make sure you write your answers on the answer sheet during the test. The computer test, you'll type your answers directly into the question spaces. So there's no time at the end to transfer. I recommend choose the easiest passage. Maybe there's one that you know about. You know, there might be a passage about management. If you're good at management or, you know, in your field, do that one first. In reading, look at the questions first. Don't read the whole passage. Look at the questions, read, but skim, then scan, looking for the correct answers. You don't have to read every word. Some question types are easy, easier. Labeling a diagram, for example, you just have to find where in, in the passage it has the answer about labeling a diagram. So look for the, the words there. Um, some of them you have to read the whole thing. If it's a, um, which paragraph is this found in, for example, those don't go in order and you just have to skim and scan the whole article and find the answers. A lot of times there will be true, false and not given or yes, no, not given. Some people don't like these, but actually they're very easy because they go in order. So you just have to find the, the first one. And then after that, the, the second one will be there. Or if it's not there, it'll be not, not given. Then the third one will be there. Yes or no, true or false or it won't be there and it'll be not given. And then you keep reading further and it'll be the next one. For the yes, no, not given, turn your question, turn these into questions. For example, on the test paper here, we'll say international trade is increasing at a greater rate than, world, than the world economy. Turn that into a question. Ask yourself, is international trade increasing at a greater rate than the world economy? Then in the reading passage, look for that answer. If it's clearly given that yes, it is, then on your paper, write yes. If it's clear that it's not true, then write no. And if you can't tell if there's no information, then it's not given. And again, these go in order. Uh, I did prepare a reading test. We're not going to do it. I've made six simple questions. Simple. Well, they're 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 from a practice IELTS uh, test, um, and they're all true, false, or not given. Because I wanted to give you some practice finding them and seeing how they go in order. That's the good thing about the yes, no, not given, or the true, false, not 
even do do these questions while you're doing some of the other ones, the multiple choice or some of the other ones, when you're reading to find those answers, and when you find the true false not given answer, then you can do them together simultaneously. Um, and again, you, you don't need all of them correct. So just guess if you don't know. Uh, again, I've included this reading test and I've included a file with the answers. So if you can give yourself at uh, later on after we finish, give yourself about five or 10 minutes, try those and then look at the answers. For further practice, you can download from IELTS.org. Cambridge IELTS books are, are good, and I recommend those. Um, keep developing your English. Use English every day. Take an IELTS prep course if you can, because that will have a teacher giving you feedback on your speaking and your writing. There are prediction tests. You could do one at the IALF. Um, take IELTS when you feel well prepared when you feel confident. And remember, go in with confidence. Feel that you've prepared and you're ready. Aim for as high of a score as you can get. Um, for further information, you can contact us. Go to IELTS.org if you have any questions. Uh, for registration, go here. And if you if you go here, you can choose where you want to do the test and if you want paper or computer, and that will connect you to IELTS online at IALF if you do it at the IALF. Um, thank you very much. Um, we're going to have time for questions and answers. Oh, I forgot to mention, the IALF actually does another test called Pearson, which is another good, very good test, but it's all done on the computer. There's no speaking test with an examiner. There's a speaking test, but you just do what the, the test asks you to do. And we also do the GMAT test. So if anybody needs GMAT, contact IALF.insertform, okay? Okay, thank you, Douglas, for sharing with us today. Now we are coming to a Q&A session. Baba Ibu, if you have questions for Douglas, please raise your hand and then uh, unmute yourself and you can ask directly to Douglas. Or you can type on Q&A column and I will read that for you. Uh, Doug, we've got two questions. The first one is from Baba Agus Yasin from Biro Perencanaan. What score do we need? for applying for a job or a business? Well, that will depend on the institution that you're going to. It'll depend on the university. It'll depend on the program, you know, which department, which major. So, because today we're talking about academics. We're not talking about work. Um, but even if it was for work, you'd have to check with your boss and see what, what score they want but for universities again like i said earlier generally six would be the lowest but usually for any postgraduate degree 6.5 or 7 could be higher if it's maybe in linguistics or something very um sophisticated thank you for the question Okay, thank you, uh, Agus, for the question. If uh, it doesn't answer your question, please type again on the Q&A chat. And then the second answer, it is from anonymous attendee. So I would like to ask you on how IELTS score is stored. Currently, I already have taken an IELTS test last year, and the result is relatively good, in my humble opinion. Suppose that I took another test this year, which score would be stored? Or do we, do you mean that uh, if I have two valid scores, which score that I can apply for the university I can use for applying for university? 
Well, you'll have to talk with your uh, advisor or counselor about that. But my guess is they'll want both both certificates and they'll use the better of the two. Uh, I did forget to mention there's starting this year, IELTS is actually going to offer a new service where you can retake just one part of the test. So if, for example, your writing score is too low, but everything else is high enough, you would be able to pay, of course, and only do the writing. Or the same with the listening, reading, and the speaking. If you have a high enough score for your purposes in the other three areas, you're you're going to be able to pay and just redo the one that's too low, which is something fantastic from IELTS. And that's nice. So next question is from uh, Pak Fajar Seno Adi. Is it okay if we use short pause in the speaking test to emphasize that some of our point in our argument? Hmm, that's a good question. I never thought about that before. Well, in my humble opinion, there's no problem with that as long as it's a pause for thinking. Hmm, that's a good question. I've never thought of that before. But if it's a pause for grammar, uh, what's the word? Mm. T, that's a problem. So no, it's not a problem if you have sh a, a short pause now and then for thinking. If the examiner thinks that you're thinking, it's okay. But if they think you're searching for grammar or searching for vocabulary, that is not good. Good question. Okay, thank you, Fajar, for your questions. And then next from Umar Bin Manik. Uh, what is the difference or are there any different uh, scoring mechanism on IELTS for academic and IELTS general training? Um, uh, okay, now I don't think this is a very good question today because your need is academic. You know, in my, in my, as far as I understand, any anyone attending today's seminar should be focused on the academic because you're planning to do a postgraduate degree. Um, yes, if I answer the question, listening and speaking are the same for the general training and the, the academic. The way they calculate the score is exactly the same. For the, gen, the general training, the content is a little bit different for the reading. It's easier. It's looking at brochures and um, less complicated, less academic material. So the questions are more, they'll be easier. So yeah, you'll need more correct to get the same score. So the, the, the scores that I was talking about today for the reading and for the listening, that's really for academic. But you can go to IELTS.org and download exact info about this, okay? So good luck. Okay, thank you, Douglas. Okay, um, ada yang bilang kenapa saya tidak menerjemahkan, mohon maaf. Uh, jadi saya untuk jawaban Douglas yang terakhir tadi, ya ada sedikit perbedaan untuk uh, IELTS yang akademik sama general training, tetapi karena Bapak Ibu nanti berencana mau studi lanjut, maka lebih baik fokus ke yang akademik, tetapi ada sedikit perbedaan ketika semacam di reading untuk IELTS yang akademik dan general training untuk mendapatkan nilai yang sama, Bapak Ibu harus betul di lebih banyak soal di general training daripada yang di akademik begitu. Uh, is there any more questions? Okay, another question. Uh, I have a question about the writing test. It is from Dara Kurniasari. 
the last time I took the IELTS test, my writing score was was kind of low. I think my weakness is my range of vocabularies. Do you have any tips for improving it? Thank you. Well, I would recommend you take a course. And it's not because I make money if someone takes a course. I recommend you have a teacher to read what you've written. It doesn't have to be a teacher. It could be a friend. You know, share share what you've written with a friend. But someone needs to read it and give you some feedback. You can read sample essays as as much as you can, but unless you get some good feedback, um, it's very hard to improve. I see this all the time. People think their English is good and then they take the test and they get a low score. Recently, I, I read a study of native speakers who did the writing. So they examined some native speakers. They gave them some, some task one and task two writing to do, and they did it. And then the scores were marked. No one got a nine. A couple of them had an 8.5. A couple of them had an eight. Most of them were at a 7.5 or a seven. So even for a native speaker, you know, just because they write an essay, it doesn't mean they're going to, to get the highest score. You have to practice. You have to know what to expect. And that's why in the writing, I tried to give you as much info and tips as possible. So okay. good luck. Hey, thank you, Douglas. So, uh, jawaban dari Douglas adalah bagaimana untuk meningkatkan writing ikut kursus. <laughs> Itu adalah jawabannya. Jadi dari kursus nanti teacher-nya akan memberikan semacam feedback dan juga saran-saran uh, apa yang harus Bapak Ibu lakukan untuk memperbaiki writing tersebut untuk mencapai skor yang diinginkan. Baik, right, because we have limited time, Doug, so we have to end this session and then move to the next session. So thank you, Douglas, for sharing with us today. Please give a, a virtual applause for Douglas. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Baik, oke. Okay. Partisipasinya, Bapak Ibu, saya kembalikan ke MC. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Douglas, and thank you, uh, Mr. Happy. That was a very knowledgeable and inspiring session. We are very grateful for the things you've shared with us today. Um, sekarang kita semua jadi lebih tahu dan lebih paham ya mengenai IELTS. Semoga nanti ketika mengerjakan tesnya di kemudian hari akan lebih lancar dan mudah. Baik, di sesi selanjutnya, uh, mari kita sambut perwakilan dari University of Western Australia yang, yang akan memberikan presentasinya mengenai persiapan studi di luar negeri. Untuk Miss Ima dan Miss Hari, kami persilahkan. Baik, terima kasih. Terima kasih. Um, terima kasih kepada Bapak dan Ibu yang telah hadir pada pagi hari ini. Sesuai dengan tema kita hari ini, uh, Using IELTS to Advance Your Future Study. Jadi sebelumnya kita telah mendengarkan uh, penjelasan mengenai IELTS test dari uh, Mr. Douglas. Dan sesi selanjutnya akan uh, akan ada presentasi dari perwakilan University of Western Australia dengan Ibu Ima Dewi. Tapi sebelum itu, uh, izinkan saya untuk berbagi sedikit informasi tentang layanan IELF Global. Um, hanya sekitar apa, uh, 5 menit saja. Baik. Jadi kita di ILF mempunyai... Uh, Divisi ILF Global yang merupakan Overseas Education Services dari ILF. Sebelum saya menjelaskan lebih lanjut tentang servis kita uh, di ILF Global, saya ingin memperkenalkan um, a amazing team, our amazing team and wonderful people behind ILF Global. Baik, di tim global kita ada Ibu Rini. Lalu ada Bapak Ketut Wirawa, ada Ibu Vita Kanisha, kemudian ada Ibu Marsha Elisa, 
dan kemudian ada saya. Kita akan lanjut mengenai lalu uh, di ILF. Jadi saya ingin menjelaskan bahwa di ILF tidak hanya kita pelayanan kita tidak hanya berhenti sampai IELTS preparation course dan IELTS test saja, tapi kita juga akan um, mendampingi ibu bapak sekalian dalam proses studi luar ke luar negeri. Lalu apa saja yang kita bisa bantu dari ILF Global itu mengenai uh, pertama kita ada service konsultasi. Jadi ini kita uh, kita akan berkonsultasi dan berdiskusi mengenai rencana studi lanjut ibu dan bapak ke luar negeri. Kemudian kita juga akan membantu ibu dan bapak uh, de, uh, mengenai university application atau yang lebih dikenal dengan untuk uh, uh, mendapatkan LW dari universitas. Lalu kita juga akan membantu ibu dan bapak sekalian de, uh, mengenai visa application hingga accommodation dan airport pickup. ILF Global telah bekerja sama dengan banyak universitas di luar negeri. Uh, beberapa negara yang bekerja sama dengan kita Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United Kingdom, Ireland, United States of America, dan beberapa negara di bagian benua Eropa. Um, Bapak Ibu bisa mengecek website kita atau mungkin mampir ke Instagram account kita untuk mengetahui lebih banyak hal mengenai ILF Global atau layanan-layanan lain yang ditawarkan oleh ILF. Kemudian hari ini kita telah kedatangan tamu spesial dari Universitas of Western Australia, Ibu Ima Dewi. Ibu Ima Dewi merupakan Senior Regional Manager in Marketing and Recruitment from the University of Western Australia. Ya, um, setelah ini saya akan um, langsung memberikan waktu dan tempat kepada ibunya. Silahkan, terima kasih. Terima kasih, Miss Hari. Uh, selamat pagi menjelang siang, Bapak Ibu, teman-teman semua. Uh, seperti yang tadi Miss Hari telah sampaikan, nama saya Ima Dewi, saya adalah perwakilan dari The University of Western Australia. Nah, tadi mungkin sudah dengar dari uh, Mr. Douglas juga, dari Ibu Dennis mengenai IELTS. Uh, jadi sekarang kita melihat dari sisi university, seperti apa sih generally untuk, uh, untuk masuk kuliah, Uh, especially in Australia untuk program S2 dan S3-nya. Nah, ini sebagai contoh yang hari ini uh, kebetulan saya perwakilan dari UWA, jadi mungkin kita bisa uh, sharing sedikit informasi ya mengenai UWA. Oke, okay, dan program apa saja yang dapat mensupport untuk uh, untuk pencapaian net zero emission. Oke, okay, saya langsung mulai saja. <tuh> Jadi mungkin Bapak Ibu teman-teman di sini oh, belum pernah ada yang dengar mengenai The University of Western Australia atau mungkin sudah pernah ada yang dengar. Jadi The University of Western Australia ini yang biasanya orang sebutnya UWA atau UDAP, lokasinya ada di kota Perth di Australia. Um, nanti kita akan bahas sedikit mengenai kota Perth dan program apa saja tadi yang dapat menunjang uh, pencapaian net zero emission dari uh, master degree dan PhD-nya syarat masuk dan program scholarship untuk bahasa Inggris dan kemudian accommodation dan Indonesian students yang ada di kampus uh, ini karena waktunya terbatas atau mungkin saya boleh play satu video dulu oke okay, sebentar ya
tadi uh, video itu menggambarkan uh, apa ya situasi di kampus dan kemudian di uh, kota Perth sendiri dan kemudian benefit-benefitnya jika kita memilih kota Perth. Nah kebetulan Perth ini adalah kota terdekat di Australia dari Indonesia. Jadi the nearest city in Australia from Indonesia. Kalau teman-teman dari Jakarta, bapak ibu dari uh, luar Jakarta pun kita bisa ada direct flight itu dari Bali. Uh, dari Bali kita direct flight hanya tiga jam setengah saja. Dulu sebelum COVID kita ada direct flight dari Jakarta ke Perth, tapi sekarang sedang tidak ada. Nanti ke- kemungkinan akan ke- akan kembali ada sekitar di bulan Maret. Uh, jadi saat ini kita masih dari Bali ke Perth itu hanya tiga jam setengah. Jadi sangat dekat dan kemudian secara time zone pun kita hanya beda satu jam saja dengan Jakarta. Jadi jika sekarang kurang lebih setengah sebelas ya di uh, di Jakarta di Perthnya itu setengah dua belas. Jadi hanya beda satu jam saja, tidak terlalu ekstrim. Kemudian kita juga memilih Perth karena uh, Perth itu merupakan salah satu kota yang biaya hidupnya termurah. Biaya hidupnya termurah di seluruh Australia dibandingkan dengan uh, Melbourne dan dengan Sydney. Perth ini uh, sangat affordable sekali, jadi Bapak Ibu jika ingin membawa keluarga, jika ingin berkuliah, berkuliah di kota Perth itu sangat-sangat affordable in terms of the living cost. Uh, kemudian juga kita itu kalau Bapak Ibu membawa uh, keluarga, itu ada juga fasilitas free schooling uh, untuk dependence dari pemerintah Australia. Jadi pemerintah Australia itu bisa bisa memberikan sekolah gratis untuk uh, anak-anaknya, anak-anak mulai pada schooling age biasanya sekitar umur lima tahun. Nah kebetulan juga uh, dari 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 students kita sudah ada kurang lebih dua students dari ESDM yang saat ini sedang berkuliah yang akan masuk di Februari intik satu tapi satu lagi sudah ada di Perth uh, karena sudah mengambil English language uh, scholarships yang gratis. Jadi ada ada program bahasa Inggris tambahan gitu untuk uh, untuk dua uh, apa dari dari ESDM uh, yang saat ini belajar kuliah ngambil master of renewable and future energy di UWA kemudian salah satu uh, dari beliau ada yang membawa keluarga dan akan mendapatkan free schooling untuk anak-anaknya itu adalah salah satu benefit juga untuk ke kota Perth kemudian uh, ini kampus kita, jadi kalau misalnya dibilang Perth ini sepi, sebetulnya Perth ini sangat enak sekali dan punya banyak sekali benefit ya. Tidak terlalu sepi, tidak terlalu rame, dan tidak sekerau di Jakarta yang pastinya. Cuman banyak sekali benefitnya. Uh, Bapak Ibu juga nanti bisa menjalankan apa uh, magang juga selagi kuliah uh, di UWA. Okay. Nah dari segi University of Western Australia sendiri kita adalah world top 100 university Jadi dari segi ranking kita sangat tinggi kita ada di ranking 90 dunia Termasuk di dalam group of eight Jadi group of eight itu adalah top 8 university di Australia Top 8 university di Australia mungkin Bapak Ibu di sini uh, pernah dengar juga Monash University gitu Melbourne University kita juga sama levelnya sama-sama dalam group of eight dan UWA ini menjadi universiti terbaik nomor satu di kota Perth di Australia kurang lebih nomor lima atau nomor enam jadi kalau di Australia sebutnya group of eight tapi kalau di Inggris sebutnya Russell Group itu top university di UK kalau di Amerika sebutnya uh, Ivy League University nah itu adalah Uh, universiti-universiti terbaik di negara-negara tersebut gitu. Jadi kalau misalnya di Indonesia kan biasanya lebih ke arah uh, akreditasi ya akreditasi dan ranking. Tapi kalau di, di Australia kita tidak terlalu membicarakan mengenai akreditasi karena semua universiti sudah bagus dan rankingnya juga sudah cukup tinggi sehingga kita melihatnya dari segi group of eight atau uh, grup-grup yang uh, merupakan top rank university. Oke, okay. nah uh, kam, lu, uh, kampus kita luasnya sekitar 32 hektar dan kita memiliki 25.000 students dengan kurang lebih 5.000 international students dari 110 negara. Uh, kalau Indonesian students sendiri di dalam kampus sekitar ada jumlahnya sekitar 500 students itu dari S1, S2, S3. Nah ini uh, kampus kita, UWA campus, kita kurang lebih 10 menit dari Perth City. Jadi dari sini ada Perth City, ini adalah UWA campus. Kita kampus kita sudah memiliki fasilitas yang sangat lengkap sekali. Uh, kita ada greenhouse sendiri, kemudian juga kita uh, untuk yang business school kita punya financial market trading room yang terbesar. Untuk agriculture kita punya uh, institut agriculture, jadi research center kita juga lengkap sekali dan kita punya ratusan labs di dalam kampus kita. 
ini adalah foto-foto kecilnya saja dari fasilitas, fasilitas kita nah kebetulan virtual background saya sepertinya juga memakai engineering zone ini jadi engineering zone ini adalah uh, nanti tempat untuk kuliah uh, bapak ibu teman-teman yang mengambil master of uh, renewable and future energy yang yang uh, kemudian teman-teman teman-teman dua orang yang dari SDM itu nanti berkuliahnya juga akan ada di dalam uh, izon building ini ada the news building kita yang semuanya sudah dioperate by robot dan pakai solar panel semua. Nah, uh, notable alumni dari UWE ada Profesor Dr. Budiono mantan wakil presiden Indonesia. Dulu beliau adalah Indonesian students pertama di UWE campus. Beliau mengambil Bachelor of Economics, uh, mantan wakil presiden Indonesia. Kemudian untuk programnya kita akan bahas langsung yang S2 dan S3. Untuk S2 ini mungkin yang perlu saya tekankan bahwa S2 di luar negeri itu biasanya ada beberapa tipe. Yang pertama adalah tipe Master by Coursework. Master by Coursework and Dissertations, dan kemudian Master by Research. Jadi Master by Coursework itu tidak membuat skripsi, tidak membuat tesis. Jadi hanya kuliah saja dengan final exam. Jadi kelulusan yang menentukan kelulusan adalah final exam. Master by Coursework and Dissertations adalah program master yang menggunakan mini tesis. Jadi kalau Bapak Ibu di sini berencana untuk mengambil S3, saya sangat merekomendasi untuk mengambil program coursework and dissertations. Jika hanya coursework saja, itu tidak mencukupi poin-poinnya uh, untuk mengambil S3, karena tidak ada program penelitian di S2-nya. Kalau jika Bapak Ibu ingin mengambil uh, program S3 nantinya, itu S2-nya harus ada komponen minimal sekali disertasi atau mau sekalian master by research atau master of philosophy. Untuk program S2 itu kurang lebih uh, durasinya sekitar satu setengah tahun sampai dua tahun. Ada yang setahun, ada yang satu setengah, ada yang dua tahun tergantung background Bapak Ibu. Jika backgroundnya sudah linear misalnya dari uh, dari chemical engineering ingin mengambil chemical engineering lagi itu hanya dua tahun saja. Eh itu hanya bisa satu setengah, bisa dua tahun. Tapi jika backgroundnya berbeda itu akan menambah durasi. Gitu. Untuk PhD kita full research itu programnya empat tahun untuk PhD untuk S3. Nah, ini adalah uh, list of relevant master degrees to support net zero emission. Jadi, di sini uh, UWA sendiri sudah memiliki MOU dengan uh, ESDM dan berikut adalah uh, list of jurusan yang bisa Bapak-Ibu mungkin consider untuk ambil untuk mensupport net zero emission. Mungkin yang sangat-sangat relevan adalah renewable and future energy saat ini, tapi di, line, di, di luar itu kita juga ada master professional engineering, seperti uh, chemical juga ada, electrical, mechanical, environmental, itu dapat menunjang juga. Kemudian environmental science, ke energy geoscience, master of mining energy law, geotechnics for offshore wind energy, kemudian architecture, kemudian commerce, data science, economics, dan public policy. Jadi uh, ini adalah sebagian kecil dari program yang UWA tawarkan, uh, namun saya saya ambil beberapa program saja yang kira-kira relevan dengan uh, net zero emission topik kita. Jadi uh, untuk program ini semua durasinya satu setengah sampai dua tahun, satu setengah sampai dua tahun ini rata-rata IELTS-nya enam koma lima, bapak ibu enam koma lima, no per less than six. Nah, mungkin kita bahas sedikit mengenai program-program yang ada. Jadi yang uh, Master of Renewable and Future Energy ini uh, mempunyai beberapa disiplin atau fokus di marine renewable, biomass, geothermal, photovoltaics, uh, electrical vehicles, dan microgrids, uh, smart grid teknologi juga. Jadi uh, ini program ini cukup bagus dan uh, bisa dikonsider untuk Uh, untuk mensupport net zero emission untuk kedok uh, clean energy. Oke, okay, kemudian untuk mata kuliahnya seperti apa yang akan dipelajari di bawah uh, renewable and future energy kurang lebih seperti ini. Fluid mechanics ini hanya conversion units yang di sebelah kiri yang sebelah kanan ini mata kuliah yang harus wajib diambil. Seperti ini kurang lebih. Nanti kita akan bagikan slides-nya ya, Bapak Ibu dan ini juga bisa diakses di website kita. Kemudian ini juga adalah optional units. Optional units ini mata kuliah yang bisa diambil di luar mata kuliah yang core tadi. Jadi ini hanya memilih saja apa yang kira-kira relevan untuk Bapak Ibu. Ini bisa diambil di optional units ini. Dan juga nanti dalam semua program kita itu akan ada magangnya. Jadi akan ada intensifnya ketika kuliah di Perth. 
Nah, ini ada satu video mungkin kita bisa lihat mengenai future and renewable, renewable and future energy. Renewable and future energy is important because renewable energy is virtually inexhaustible and it is also a key to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So renewable energy is actually the answer to depleting fossil fuels and combating climate change. The students will learn about various renewable energy generation sources like solar, wind, thermal, hydro, wave. They will learn about energy storage, the microgrids, how to analyze and design microgrids. They will learn about energy policy, energy forecasting. So there are a lot of interesting units. There will be many opportunities for employment. Students have the opportunity to go into the utility industries, uh, mining or oil and gas, government or research organizations uh, to work in the renewable energy space. So if you have a background in mathematics, science uh, or engineering and have an interest in sustainable living, I, I think renewable energy would be a good program to pursue. Jadi itu tadi dari uh, program koordinatornya uh, Master of Renewable and Future Energy, profesornya yang mempunyai program tersebut. Dan kemudian kita juga ada Master Professional Engineering. Master Professional Engineering ini uh, mempunyai banyak spesialisasi juga. Jadi nanti gelarnya adalah MPE. Master Professional Engineering ini berkisar sekitar 2 tahun durasinya. 2 tahun jika backgroundnya sudah sama. Jadi misalnya dari uh, mechanical Engineering dari teknik mesin, kemudian ingin mengambil mekanikal lagi, itu hanya dua tahun saja. Kemudian kita juga ada yang sangat bagus sekali adalah environmental engineering. Ini uh, Profesor Anas Gaudani juga sangat-sangat uh, bagus sebagai salah satu dosen yang sangat favorit itu di bidang environmental engineering, beliau ada program koordinatornya. Kemudian kita juga ada environmental science, mungkin sebagian ini uh, ada yang sedikit relevan, Uh, tapi tidak serelevan renewable ya, cuman uh, bisa dikonsider juga untuk sustainable global environment. Uh, Master of Environmental Science ini durasinya sekitar satu setengah tahun sampai dua tahun. Jika sudah dari background environmental, itu hanya satu setengah tahun saja. Kemudian uh, ada juga Master of Energy Geoscience. Ini juga uh, salah satu program yang dapat mensupport net zero emission. Nah, program ini juga durasi satu setengah sampai dua tahun. Jadi, uh, ini ada pilihannya. The Master of Energy Geoscience is a two-year coursework or coursework and dissertations. Jadi, apakah misalnya jika ada yang bertanya, apakah jika mengambil coursework saja, apakah durasinya akan berbeda dengan coursework and dissertations? Uh, tidak. Jadi, yang membedakan durasi itu bukan dari programnya, tapi adalah dari backgroundnya. Jadi jika backgroundnya sudah sama, kemudian itu hanya satu setengah tahun atau dua, uh, bisa tidak melebihi durasi dua tahun. Tapi jika backgroundnya berbeda, itu akan menambah durasi. Jadi bukan kita kita tolak, biasanya kita akan tetap consider, namun akan menambah durasi. Nah, uh, jadi bisa memilih Bapak Ibu mau kuliah saja atau kuliah dengan mengerjakan mini tesis. Jadi jika tidak mengerjakan tesis, itu akan diganti full akan semua mata kuliah harus dikerjakan sampai selesai, tapi jika ingin mengambil disertasi, beberapa mata kuliah itu akan digantikan dengan disertasi. Kemudian kita juga ada Master of Mining Energy Law, mungkin ini uh, sedikit relevan tapi tidak terlalu relevan sekali. Uh, kita juga ada uh, Climate Change and Emission Trading, uh, pelajaran di, di dalam Energy Law ini. Ini kurang lebih satu tahun sampai satu setengah tahun saja. Jika law, jika jurusan yang berbau uh, hukum, law itu biasanya IELTS-nya lebih tinggi. Jadi sekitar 7,0 untuk IELTS-nya. Tapi di luar hukum itu hanya enam setengah saja. Kemudian kita juga ada Master of Commerce. Ini untuk yang uh, bekerja di bidang bisnis atau mungkin di bidang keuangan untuk mensupport net zero emission. Ada finance yang cukup populer, uh, economics. Ini juga bisa diambil, jadi di bawah Master of Commerce ini bisa mengambil dua spesialisasi. Jadi tidak hanya satu, misalnya belajar finance itu bisa juga belajar economics. Dan kemudian ini juga sudah akan mendapatkan magang. Durasinya kurang lebih satu setengah sampai dua tahun. Dan ini bisa terima dari background apapun. Jika misalnya backgroundnya dari engineering kemudian ingin mengambil bisnis itu bisa. Tapi jika dari background bisnis ingin mengambil teknik, nah itu yang akan susah. 
Kemudian kita juga ada data science uh, yang saat ini sedang booming juga dan ke, uh, dan mungkin saya pikir bisa mensupport juga untuk uh, net zero emissions karena untuk collecting data karena kan kita apa uh, semuanya itu sekarang based on data ya jadi I think data scientists will be quite important as well uh, and then we also have Master of Economics, Master of Economics ini juga sangat bagus juga untuk mensupport. Master of Economics ini mempunyai beberapa spesialisasi yang ada di sebelah kanan. Jadi ada Advanced Economics, Applied Economics, Financial Economics, Health Economics, and Research Dissertation. Jadi bisa mengambil spesialisasi di bidang economics. Durasi satu setengah sampai dua tahun, IELTSnya sama 6,5 saja. Nah, saya tidak bahas semuanya, mungkin nanti karena akan terlalu panjang waktunya, jadi saya akan masuk ke dalam entry requirement, dan juga ini adalah work integrated learning. Jadi work, work integrated learning ini adalah uh, industry knowledge atau uh, magang internship yang student semua student bisa ambil ketika kuliah di UWA, itu nanti kita akan bantu pencarian magangnya. Jadi magangnya itu akan paralel sembari kuliah, jadi magangnya akan lebih part-time, kuliahnya tetap akan full-time, dan magangnya bisa part-time. Uh, namun jika ingin magang full-time, itu bisa juga ketika libur. Jadi libur di Australia itu uh, summer cukup lama, dari bulan November, Desember, Januari, Februari, itu biasanya kurang lebih 3-4 bulan itu libur bisa untuk magang full-time. Kita punya banyak sekali partnership, ini hanya sebagian kecil saja, tapi kita punya jauh lebih banyak daripada ini partnership-nya, especially in Perth, karena kita juga merupakan universitas yang sangat-sangat dituju oleh banyak company untuk mendapatkan intern dari kita, karena kita adalah universitas terbaik di kota Perth. Nah, tadi saya bicara mengenai best value, jadi best value ini kan begitu banyak pilihan universitas di Australia. Uh, namun dari group of eight yang ada, UW ini merupakan salah satu yang best value. Jadi uh, kita dari segi ranking kita dapat dalam top 100 dunia, dari segi biaya hidup kita paling murah, kemudian kita juga dari segi uang kuliah itu adalah paling affordable, paling murah juga dari semua top 8 di Australia. Uh, kemudian juga kita menawarkan kompetitif uh, scholarship potongan-potongan kemarin untuk dua student dari SDM juga mendapatkan potongan kecil sekitar 5.000 sampai 10.000 dolar dari program tersebut. Um, untuk semester dates-nya uh, untuk uh, saat ini yang terdekat Fe Februari intake yang sudah berjalan untuk dua student dari SDM dan kemudian nanti kita the following uh, intake ada Juli intake. Uh, untuk aplikasi bisa dibantu oleh IELF uh, dengan dengan IELF tim akan dibantu itu tidak ada biaya apapun untuk pendaftaran ke kampus uh, jika mendaftar melalui website kami langsung itu akan ada biaya 100 dolar namun jika melalui IELF itu tidak ada biaya apapun dan especially untuk SDM karena kita sudah bekerja sama jadi uh, tidak ada biaya untuk aplikasinya kemudian the following intake kita ada 2024 juga untuk Februari dan Juli juga Nah, untuk membaca mata kuliah yang ada, ini adalah website pegangan saya, jadi jangan hanya di Google saja, tapi bisa membuka www.handbooks.uwa.edu.au and then bisa type the keywords, ini lumayan sensitive case, jadi jangan typo, karena kalau typo tidak akan keluar uh, untuk uh, list of apa jurusan tersebut. Oke. Okay. Nah, kemudian untuk admission requirements-nya, syarat masuknya seperti apa? Jadi yang kita butuhkan hanya IPK saja, IPK S1 atau GPA dari Indonesia. Kita tidak terlalu apa ya, tidak terlalu mempermasalahkan mengenai akreditasi selama itu selama University Bapak Ibu sudah terdaftar dalam ban PT, tidak masalah itu kita hanya meminta IPK-nya 2,8 sampai 3,0 saja untuk mendaftar di program master degree kita dari semua master degree yang tadi saya sebut itu IPK 2,8 sampai 3,0 Uh, IELTS 6,5, no band lesson 6, kecuali jurusan law. Kalau jika ada yang ingin mengambil TOEFL IBT, itu 82. Dan tidak memerlukan personal statement, tidak memerlukan reference letter, tidak memerlukan work experience. Jadi tidak perlu melampirkan dokumen-dokumen ini. Kemungkinan CV akan diminta, karena CV itu akan menjelaskan selama gap setelah lulus dari S1 atau setelah lulus dari S2,
baik uh, sepertinya ada ini ya technical problem mungkin uh, jadi sambil menunggu uh, Miss Ina mungkin saya take over dulu uh, kita udah ada beberapa pertanyaan dari uh, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian Oke, okay. uh, um, pertanyaan pertama, apakah ada silabus minimum GPA dan required documents needed to apply? Um, tadi Miss Ima sudah sempat menjelaskan beberapa dokumen yang dibutuhkan, termasuk GPA 3,0, IELTS 6,5, no less than less, uh, no than less than six. Dan juga CV itu dibutuhkan. Oke, untuk pertanyaan program S3 dan mengenai PhD program and course, ini akan dijawab oleh Miss Emma setelah Miss Emma berhasil kembali. Uh, Miss Hari, sorry. Oh, sudah? Ya, Oke, okay. uh. iya. Yeah. Tiba-tiba mati lampunya, sorry banget. Ya, Bapak-Ibu mohon maaf, ini saya kembali lagi ke slides-nya. Uh, sudah bisa terlihat, Miss Hari? Sudah, Miss Ima. Ya. Jadi tadi saya uh, sedang bicara mengenai ini ya, mengenai syarat masuk. Jadi additional requirements-nya, kita untuk yang masa renewable and future energy ini membutuhkan background dari engineering. Jadi untuk ini yang special requirements ya Bapak Ibu. Jadi untuk yang master professional uh, master renewable and future energy kita membutuhkan background dari professional engineering, uh, spesialisasinya di bidang electrical, chemical, kemudian uh, mechanical dan uh, related cognitive discipline. Jadi jika Bapak Ibu mungkin backgroundnya belum dari ini tetap bisa dicoba kita akan bantu. Uh, kita akan bantu untuk uh, assessment dengan admission. Kemudian untuk uh, ini potongan scholarships-nya jadi hanya kecil saja potongannya tergantung dari IPK S1 Bapak Ibu ini untuk program S2-nya. Kemudian kita juga ada yang sangat ini adalah salah satu kerjasama kita dengan ESDM yaitu dengan English Language Course Scholarships. Jadi Bapak Ibu jika IELTS-nya sudah mencapai 6,0 Tadi seperti yang Mr. Douglas sampaikan bahwa biasanya minimal 6,0. Tapi untuk program S2 memang kita mintanya 6,5. Dan untuk untuk di, jika Bapak-Ibu itu IELTS-nya masih di 6,0, kita tetap bisa terima dengan minimum 5,5 in each band. Kita akan memberikan 10 minggu bahasa Inggris gratis. Jadi ini di-endorse oleh dari sponsor liaison UWA, spesial untuk SDM. Uh, memberikan 10 minggu bahasa Inggris gratis dengan biaya hidup yang akan di-cover selama 12 minggu. Program ini harus diambil offline di Perth, jadi uh, nanti akan menjalani kurang lebih 10 minggu kelas bahasa Inggris sebelum memasuki program masternya. Tapi nanti over letternya sudah akan di-package, di-package dari uh, bahasa Inggris dan kemudian untuk uh, program master tersebut. Dan PhD juga bisa berlaku untuk PhD S3 untuk mengambil uh, bahasa Inggris gratis ini. Oke, okay. kemudian untuk S3 mungkin sedikit saja. Jadi untuk program S3 ini kita akan membantu mencarikan supervisor. Jadi nanti Bapak Ibu bisa mengisi expression of interest-nya. Kemudian melampirkan dua halaman research proposal, tidak lebih dari dua halaman. Kemudian akan bisa melampirkan CV dan juga email ke S dibantu oleh ILF Global untuk mengemail ke application dan CRS. Jadi nanti dibantu oleh tim ILF untuk untuk memproses pencarian supervisor ini kurang lebih prosesnya sekitar 2 sampai 4 minggu dan supervisor yang dibutuhkan itu minimal 2. Jadi jika hanya mendapatkan satu supervisor itu belum bisa mengisi aplikasi untuk program PhD. Jadi harus mempunyai minimal 2 supervisor di UWA untuk bisa mendapatkan LOA untuk program S3. ini saya tidak akan bahas, nanti akan saya share saja slides-nya. Kemudian ini ada riset repositorinya. Jadi jika Bapak Ibu ingin men, ingin melihat nama-nama dosen siapa saja yang uh, yang ada di bidang riset area Bapak Ibu bisa bisa melalui riset repository ini. Uh, jika tidak tahu siapapun, uh, leave it with us. We will find the supervisor for you. Oke, okay. jadi kita tidak ada listnya ya Bapak Ibu, ada program S3 apa saja, tapi kita akan tergantung purely dengan availability dari supervisor kita. 
Oke, okay. untuk S3 IELTS-nya 6,5, no band less than 6 saja. Jadi 6.5 no band less than 6. Untuk accommodations itu biasanya nanti akan ada akan kita bantu carikan juga atau nanti dengan koneksi teman-teman yang sudah ada di sana mungkin dari teman-teman SDM yang sudah ada di sana bisa membantu memberikan reference juga di mana saja untuk tempat tinggalnya jika membawa keluarga atau masih single untuk berangkat sendiri itu kita banyak options untuk bisa mencari tempat tinggal di sana. Tapi tipsnya karena saat ini Perth itu sedang sangat-sangat in demand, jadi untuk pencarian pencarian uh, akomodasi ini bisa jauh-jauh hari juga. Dan untuk pendaftaran dari uh, program sendiri, untuk program S2, itu kurang lebih minimal uh, 3-4 bulan sebelum, karena proses admission juga cukup lama, kita harus apply visa juga yang akan dibantu oleh ILF, dan kemudian untuk PhD kurang lebih 6 bulan sebelum untuk prosesnya. Oke, okay. kemudian uh, ini adalah foto-foto Indonesian students kita, Bapak Ibu dari uh, Indonesia yang ada di UWA. Nah, ini ke kemudian Bapak Ibu yang kemarin merayakan 17 Agustus di uh, tahun kemarin bersama anak-anak mereka di Kota Perth. Sekian mungkin dari saya jika ada pertanyaan. Tadi mohon maaf terputus ya. Ya, yeah. sudah ada beberapa pertanyaan, Miss Ima. Uh, yeah. Mungkin saya bisa bacakan beberapa. Um, ada tanya dari Bapak Noval, apakah ada jurusan public policy khususnya terkait energi atau energi baru terbarukan? Oke, okay. public policy kita ada. Uh, untuk spesialisasi dari public policy kita harus cek di handbooks. Jadi uh, sebentar, sepertinya ini untuk tadi ya di handbooks.uw.edu.au kita ketik saja public policy. Public policy ini spesialisasinya ada di Um, economics, public administration, and governance and law. Jadi tidak terlalu spesifik ya Pak. Iya tadi seperti yang uh, tadi dengan Pak siapa? Nova. Nova. Iya. Jadi uh, untuk energi energi terbaru. Nah kebetulan kita belum ada Pak. Jadi kita hanya ada di economics, public administration, and governance and law. Ini saja. Selanjutnya, apakah ada program S3 di bidang metalurgi atau mineral processing di uh, yeah. University of Western Australia? Jadi kalau di program uh, PhD memang kita tidak ada listnya, tapi kita punya supervisornya untuk metalurgi. Yes, we have the supervisor in metalurgi uh, karena sudah ada beberapa PhD yang uh, area risetnya di bidang tersebut. Jadi nanti bisa mengisi expression of interest dan melampirkan dua lemah research proposal dan CV uh, bisa dibantu oleh ILF Global untuk uh, mengemail ke application desk CRS-nya. Baik, kemudian, um, is it permitted or convenient to take family while I take PhD programs at UWA? Yes, yes, absolutely. The... Jadi, absolutely, you can bring your family. Uh, untuk untuk di kota Perth sendiri sangat family friendly juga. Dan tadi seperti yang saya mention di awal, bahwa anak-anak dapat sekolah gratis uh, pada schooling age mereka. Dan juga kota Perth juga uh, sangat enak karena biaya hidupnya cukup murah untuk membawa keluarga. Tapi boleh untuk membawa keluarga selama mengambil program S2 dan S3 di UWA. Baik. Um, banyak pertanyaan mengenai uh, uh, jurusan S3. Apakah uh, ada di bidang geokimia atau PhD terkait ketahanan energi seperti itu. Um, mm -hmm. Iya, jadi tadi S3 itu kita tidak ada listnya, jadi kita tidak membuat list karena betul-betul tergantung uh, supervisor dan dosen-dosen kita. Jadi memang kita nggak list, tapi kita punya supervisorsnya, jadi nanti bisa mengisi person of interest dan melampirkan research proposalnya saja. Iya. Kita akan mencarikan supervisor. Kemudian uh, dari Ibu Nella, boleh dijelaskan tadi mengenai program tambahan bahasa Inggris di Perth? Yang diperoleh salah satu pegawai SDM tadi, apakah ini akan otomatis didapatkan jika kita mendaftar program ini? Terima kasih. Oke, okay, terima kasih. Jadi untuk program uh, 10 minggu bahasa Inggris gratis tadi itu nanti uh, biasanya mendaftar dulu ya ke university, kemudian sudah diterima di university, sudah mendapatkan over letter dan jika IELTS-nya kurang masih di 6,0 with no band less than 5.5, jadi minimumnya 6.0 with no band less than 5.5, nanti uh, bisa info 
ke saya nanti saya akan mintakan approval dengan uh, Dev Cornell dari sponsor liaison kita director dari sponsor liaison kita untuk memberikan garansi letternya jadi kita juga akan mengeluarkan garansi letter untuk program 10 minggu bahasa Inggris gratis dengan 12 minggu biaya hidup jadi nanti kita akan keluarkan financial garantinya itu untuk bisa membantu mengapply visa dan ketika nanti sampai di Perth kita bisa urus untuk uh, transfer uh, untuk stipendnya untuk biaya hidupnya dan bisa langsung memulai programnya jadi Mungkin jangan terlalu mepet dengan intake karena program tersebut itu tidak running setiap bulan ya. Jadi intake-nya setahun hanya 3-4 kali saja. Jadi nanti jika uh, bisa dipercepat uh, mulai dari program pengaplian university dan juga untuk test IELTS-nya, jadi nanti bisa tahu kira-kira kapan bahasa Inggrisnya bisa diambil. Jadi jangan terlalu mepet. Paling nggak minimal 4-5 bulan sebelum uh, intake untuk master programnya itu sudah harus mulai dari bahasa Inggrisnya. Baik, mungkin kita tidak bisa menjawab semua pertanyaannya karena keterbatasan waktu. Mungkin ini pertanyaan terakhir. Apakah program doktoral atau PhD dapat diikuti oleh lulusan master degree atau pasca sarjana lulusan Indonesia? Betul, bisa sekali. Jadi untuk kita sebagian besar, hampir semua dari PhD kita itu dari S2-nya dari Indonesia, Uh, justru malah sangat lebih mudah karena dari Indonesia ini S2-nya sudah ada tesis. Cuman biasanya kalau yang lulusan luar negeri gitu ya, nah kebanyakan S2 mereka hanya coursework saja. Nah itu yang biasanya menghambat untuk pengambilan pengambilan S3. Cuman jika dari Indonesia itu sangat sangat uh, sangat sangat kita bisa terima karena sudah ada tesisnya di S2-nya. Jadi uh, apa namanya bisa pak? Baik. Uh, untuk uh, jangan khawatir Bapak Ibu untuk pertanyaan-pertanyaan yang belum jawab bisa nanti menghubungi kita kembali mungkin di lain waktu mungkin kita akan ada uh, sesi webinar lagi mungkin gitu jadi uh, saya harapkan semoga tidak uh, jangan khawatir nanti kita bisa ketemu di luar uh, webinar atau mengunjungi web kita atau mengunjungi uh, mengunjungi ILF uh, saya rasa um, karena kebetulan waktu kita cukupkan sampai di sini dulu. Terima kasih banyak, Miss Ima, dan saya kembalikan ke MC. Terima kasih, Miss Hari. Terima kasih, Bapak Ibu. Thank you. Terima kasih, Miss Ima dan juga Miss Hari. Uh, bagi semua yang ingin melanjutkan studinya di luar negeri, materi hari ini sangat membantu ya. Siapa tahu nanti banyak yang memutuskan untuk melanjutkan studinya di University of Western Australia nih. Oke, okay. baik untuk hadirin sekalian karena uh, kita sudah mulai menginjak akhir acara, izin mengingatkan untuk mengisi link evaluasi yang sudah kami sematkan uh, di layar uh, agar bisa mendapatkan sertifikat webinar hari ini. Terima kasih. Um, kami ingatkan untuk mengisi link evaluasi ini segera karena akses linknya hanya dibuka sampai besok pukul 4 sore. Terima kasih. Mungkin demikian rangkaian acara webinar Using IELTS to Advance Your Future Study. Terima kasih untuk semua peserta yang sudah hadir di acara hari ini. Semoga kita dapat bertemu lagi untuk bertukar pembelajaran di kemudian hari. Thank you and see you next time. Goodbye.